If you have a concentrated stock position, and this could be because you inherited it, this could be because you bought a stock that went up in value quite a bit, or this could be because you're an executive or you have a role at your company in which a large part of your compensation comes in the form of stock. But regardless of how you acquired it, if you have a large concentrated stock position, it can be difficult to divest out of that. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking about what should you do when you have a large concentrated stock position from an investment perspective, a tax perspective, and even an emotional perspective. This is another episode of Ready for Retirement. I'm your host, James Canole, and I'm here to teach you how to get the most out of life with your money. And now, on to the episode. Today, we're going to be talking about stock positions, single stock positions. What should you do with them? Now, real quick to cut to the chase, if you think my answer is going to be always sell and diversify, that's not true. There are certainly cases where that shouldn't be or doesn't need to be, at least, the approach that you take. So make sure that you stay tuned through entire episodes so we can start to see if you have the stock position, how should you think about this in terms of how this fits in your overall plan. Today's episode is based on a listener question, and this question comes from Sarah. Sarah says this. She says, I'm an employee at a large tech company, and I have vested RSUs over the last four years. Some of my stock has appreciated four times since it was granted. My non-company stock brokerage account value is around $700,000, and on top of that, my vested company stock, Apple, is worth $250,000 at the moment. I expect to continue to accumulate more company stock through ESPPs and RSU grants, which are part of stock compensation, by the way, over time. My gross income is around $325,000, $200,000 of this is salary, and $125,000 of it is annual RSU stock grants. I would like to take action to diversify this position into other stocks. The reason I would like to diversify is to reduce my portfolio risk. As I've heard in podcasts before, I know that I should not have too much of my net worth in one stock, and the only free lunch is diversification. I can sell all 250,000 vested shares tomorrow, but then I believe I would get hit with a large tax bill for all the gains, which seems like it could be a burden. I am thinking I could start by selling the shares I've held for a year to make sure to get the long-term gains tax rate instead of the short-term gain tax rate. And the next year, I could sell the stock I got this year, etc., etc. I'm looking for any guidance you may have as I figure out a good way to exit and diversify this position. Well, Sarah, thank you very much for that. And a lot to unpack here, but I think this is a good question. And I know that this question specifically is about an individual, Sarah, who accumulated a concentrated position in her company stock. And her company here is Apple. Now, this is not a recommendation for or against Apple, but we're going to use as an example. But she built this concentrated position through stock compensation, restricted stock units and employee stock purchase plan. Now, whether that's how you built your concentrated stock position or you just have an individual stock in your portfolio that's gone up substantially or you inherited it or whatever the case may be, the principles that we're going to walk through are going to be the same. Before we go into today's episode, want to, as always, thank all of you who have left reviews for this show. It does help a lot of people find this show as they're searching through iTunes or Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever the case may be. And as always, want to highlight a review of the week. This week's review comes from Sandy808. The title is Excellent Breakdown, Five Star Review. James, I loved episode 160. In my mind, I knew that my withdrawal rate would fluctuate and I needed to account for changing needs, but the way you broke it down and quantified how much I would need in each bucket and how to calculate it in the present value made so much sense to me. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. I learned so much from your podcast. Sandy808, thank you very much for that feedback. Let's me know what content is valuable to you and helps other people find the show. Thank you very much for taking the time to do that. If you're listening, if you could take a few moments just to leave a quick review would really mean quite a bit to me. So let's now jump into the episode. And what we're going to be talking about is the single concentrated stock positions. How do we account for that? Are those good? Are those bad? Do those fit in our plan? Do those not fit into our plan? If they don't, how do I go about selling and diversifying? So many detailed questions can come from what seems like a pretty simple question of what do I do with a concentrated stock position? Here's how I'd recommend starting though. Anytime we're looking at something, it's important not just to have information about it. It's most important to organize our thinking and structure the way in which we view the actual question or the actual issue at hand. Here's what I mean by that. The common perception is, okay, I have a concentrated stock position. So in Sarah's case, she owns Apple and Apple's gone up four times since she bought it. Well, what does that mean? It means if she sold all of her stock today, there's a pretty significant tax bill. Let's do 
So that's the common thinking of, okay, the common perceptions, I need to avoid a huge tax bill, what should I do? Now, I'm not saying that's wrong. You should absolutely be mindful of any tax consequences or implications of what you're doing. However, the reality is this, a downturn in a single stock could be much more damaging than your potential tax bill could be. The tax bill, at least at the federal level, at the maximum, in today's terms, in 2023, at a maximum, assuming these are long-term capital gains, your tax bill will be 23.8% of your gain at the federal level. 23.8%, where that comes from, is 20% is the top marginal capital gain tax bracket. And then there's a 3.8% net investment income tax if your income's over certain thresholds. So that's the max that you could be paying in taxes. Now, that's just on the gain. If we look at a stock downturn, though, the potential damage there, so if we're looking at taxes as a damage or downturn as a damage, the potential downturn, the damage done there is unlimited. It can take out both your gain and your initial principal investment. So the first thing that we need to do when we're, when we're asking ourselves these questions of what do I do with a concentrated stock isn't to say sell it or not sell it. It's to understand and to reframe the issue into what's the actual real risk here. Yes, there's a risk of paying taxes. Now, that being said, taxes are going to be due at some point. So by not paying them today doesn't necessarily mean those are going away, but there is that thing that we need to understand. There's that burden of the tax bill. On the other hand, the much more significant potential burden is a potential downturn in that stock value. So yes, an individual stock position does have the potential to outperform the market as a whole, but it can also underperform. And I have some data on that, that towards the end of this episode that I think you're going to find really interesting and really helps to frame some of these decisions. But as a starting point, that's where I would begin. Don't look at taxes as the sole risk. Taxes are something we want to be mindful of and we want to manage around, but we don't want that to become the guiding factor that determines how we make every single decision. We want to make decisions based on optimizing potential benefits and by minimizing potential risks. So to start, we want to say, what's the biggest risk? Well, the biggest risk is a potential downturn. So that being said, as you look at that, does that mean that you should always sell a concentrated stock position? Because when you look at it, you realize, okay, the potential downside of a market downturn or this stock not performing well, it can be dramatically more painful than paying the tax bill from selling the stock. Well, no, you should not in all cases just automatically sell your stock. So let's talk about when should you be concerned about having a large concentrated position and when shouldn't you be. To put it simply, if you can survive worst case scenario and still be okay, both financially and emotionally, you don't necessarily need to sell a concentrated stock position, or at least sell all of it. Here's what I mean by that. Let's look at an example and then apply some principles to it or extract some principles from it. Let's look at two different people that want to retire. And both of these individuals determined they need $80,000 per year from their portfolio in order to do so. Now, they both have $2 million in a brokerage account. The first individual in that brokerage account, 1.6 million of it is in a diversified stock and bond portfolio and the remaining $400,000 is in Apple stock. Again, this is not a recommendation for or against Apple. I'm just using it because it was used in Sarah's example. You could fill in Apple stock for any company of your choosing. I'm just using that because obviously it's very well known and it was part of the question. So first individual has $1.6 million split between diversified stocks and bonds and $400,000 in Apple. Well, let's assume there's a horrible bear market that applies only to Apple. The rest of the market does fine, but Apple, for whatever reason, loses 70% of its value. Now, we can argue whether or not that's likely in a different conversation. I'm just using this as an example to say Apple drops by value or in value by 70%. That's not a pleasant experience. That's a very bad experience for that stock, but let's see what it does to this individual's portfolio. And for the sake of simplicity, we're going to say the remaining portion of this individual's portfolio stayed stable. So what does that mean? Well, the 1.6 million in diversified stocks and bonds is still 1.6 million. The $400,000 of Apple stock, though, that turns to $120,000 of Apple stock. So now this individual's portfolio is $1.72 million. Well, if this individual is looking to retire, we already established that they need $80,000 per year from their portfolio. Well, depending upon this individual's age, or let's assume that this individual, based upon their age in their portfolio makeup and their needs, determined they could take out 5% per year of their portfolio and have that be sustainable over time. 
Well, 5% of $1.72 million is $86,000. So even with a horrible experience in that specific stock, they're generating enough income to be okay. They've survived that financially, even through a 70% downturn. Now let's take a look at the other investor. The other investor also has $2 million in their portfolio. The other investor also wants to live on $80,000 per year. And the other investor is also ready to retire. The difference is the other investor has 100% of their portfolio in Apple stock. Well, if we assume the same experience that stock, a 70% downturn, all of a sudden that $2 million portfolio is down to $600,000. Now, if you take a 5% withdrawal rate on that, that's only $30,000 per year, which is nowhere close to what this person wants to live on. Now, not only that, but I would never apply a standard withdrawal rule to a single stock. Hey everyone, it's me again for the disclaimer. Please be smart about this. Before doing anything, please be sure to consult with your tax planner or financial planner. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as investment, tax, legal, or other financial advice. It is for informational purposes only. What do I mean by that? Well, when you look at the 4% rule or other withdrawal rate rules, it's not just an arbitrary number that you can take from your portfolio regardless of how it's invested. It's assuming some level and some layer of diversification, and that diversification is what allows for a minimum level of withdrawal from that portfolio, regardless of what's happening in the markets. Individual stocks, though, are highly volatile, and you can't really come up with the rule for how much you could withdraw from, let's say, Apple stock versus Google stock versus Tesla stock versus McDonald's stock, for example, because we have no idea how those stock values are going to fluctuate. You need some level of diversification because when something's properly diversified, no, you can't predict the future, but you can say, how would this mix of stocks or bonds or different types of stocks and bonds performed during periods of high growth and low growth, high inflation and low inflation, up times and down times. So you start to get a sense of range of expected outcomes. That's what you can build a standard withdrawal rate from, not just an individual stock. So going back to the point here, you see this two different investors, same exact value in their portfolio, same exact retirement desires in terms of how much they need from their portfolio. Both of them have concentrated stock position. However, one of them was okay, even with a significant downturn in the value of that stock, while the other was certainly not okay. Their portfolio dropped substantially to a point where they probably had to keep working or significantly reduce how much they could take from their portfolio. So what's the takeaway from this? Is there some rule of thumb for how much you should own in stock? You know, some people say don't own more than 5% of your net worth or your portfolio in one single stock. Some say don't own more than 10% of your portfolio as one single stock. A better approach is how much could you afford to lose? From a strictly financial standpoint, and there are other considerations, but from a strictly financial standpoint, if you want to know how much can you hold in one company stock or one company stock, you need to understand how much could you afford to lose and still be okay. And by be okay, I mean still be able to meet your financial goals, whether those goals are retirement or buying a home or sending kids to college or whatever it might be. For example, this is a very extreme example. Let's assume that you've determined you need $50,000 per year to live on. And you could generate 50,000 per year from a million dollars in a portfolio, but you just inherited $100 million. It just showed up in your bank account today. And you received that and you said, you know what, that's awesome, that's great, but I still only need $50,000 per year. There's nothing more I'd wanna spend my money on. Again, I'm using a fairly extreme, not fairly, a very extreme example here to illustrate this. Well, if $1 million could fully support you forever, because let's assume a 5% withdrawal rate from that could generate all the income you need, you could theoretically invest the other 99 million of that $100 million inheritance into a single stock. And if that single stock, even if it went bankrupt, let's assume that stock happened to be Silicon Valley Bank and you lost it all. Well, it's not fun, but financially, you still have your remaining million left, I'm going to assume is properly diversified, that can generate that $50,000 per year. Now, would it be smart to do that? Almost certainly not. Can you afford it? Well, from a financial standpoint, yes. Assuming you truly do only need that specific amount from your portfolio, you could afford it. Your retirement goals, what you're actually trying to accomplish, is still going to happen. Now, emotionally, could you afford it? That's another story. I think emotionally, trying to think about what that pain would feel like versus actually feeling that pain when that money is gone are two very different things. 
And I'm not assuming that every individual stock is going to become worth zero. That's absolutely not the case. But when you're going to hold a concentrated stock position, you have to be prepared for worst case scenario. And worst case scenario doesn't even mean that company stock goes to zero. It could just mean this company stock drops 50%, 60%, 70% and never really recovers. Are you prepared for that? And are you prepared for that from a financial standpoint? And are you prepared for that from an emotional standpoint? Because even if you don't technically need that money that's in the individual stock to meet your goals, it's still not going to feel good. It's still probably going to keep you up at night if that stock is dropping dramatically and a very significant portion of your net worth is dropping with it. So to summarize this, when you're looking at a concentrated stock position, you have to ask yourself, if you keep it, can you live with the potential downside both from a financial perspective, could you still meet your goals, and an emotional perspective? What's this going to do to your peace of mind or your sanity if this significant stock position really declines? Because the probability is you're going to underperform the market. Now, that's not a statement on Apple or any individual stock. It's just a statement on the average stock within the market. JP ran a study that I love to cite, and it's in a paper called The Agony and the Ecstasy. And it showed, going back to 1980, if you look at the Wilshire 3000, which is pretty much the entirety or almost the entirety of the U.S. stock market, 3,000 stocks in the U.S. stock market, two out of three stocks within the Wilshire 3000 underperformed the Wilshire 3000. In other words, one out of three outperformed, if you take the average of all 3,000 of those stocks, and two out of three underperformed. How can that be? Well, that is the case because the average stock that outperforms, or even a handful of stocks that significantly outperform, those significantly offset the negative impact of the more than average stock that underperforms. So two out of three stocks is actually underperforming the index as a whole because the best performers are pretty much the ones that are driving the performance of the index as a whole. Now, not just this, but when a stock underperforms, it's not as if the Wilshire 3000 averages, say, 10% a year, and then the average stock performs or averages 8% per year. A lot of them have a pretty devastating downside. JP Morgan in the study that calls this catastrophic losses. And so we think, oh yeah, okay, maybe that was Enron or maybe that was Silicon Valley Bank. You know, there's a couple of stocks here and there that yes, you have all your money there, you lost it all. But those are few and far between. Maybe they're not that common. Well, consider this. Since 1980, and this I'm quoting right from the article here, since 1980, roughly 40% of all stocks in the Wilshire 3000 have suffered a permanent 70 plus percent decline from their peak value. For technology, biotech, and metals and mining, the numbers were considerably higher." End quote. So you look at that, 40% is a significant number. Four out of 10 stocks in the index had a devastating or catastrophic loss defined as a 70 plus percent decline from their peak value that they never recovered from. So as you're looking at this, is that something that you can live with? When I talk about can you live with the financial implications of a stock downturn or a concentrated stock position dropping in value, most of us say yes, because in the back of our mind, we're not really thinking that can happen to our company stock. We're not really thinking that can happen to the stock that we inherited or we purchased or that we've held for some period of time. But the reality is it's not unlikely for stocks, number one, just to underperform in general, but number two, to dramatically underperform and to even have catastrophic losses that they don't recover from. So that's just some information to be aware of as you're looking at your individual stock position and what's the greater risk, paying the tax bill, and you know, going back to Sarah's question on the stock that's appreciated and then diversifying versus holding the individual stock. And you have to be aware of what are both going to cost you. The first, so selling the stock now, it's going to cost you some taxes today. Now, it's not as if those taxes are going to be delayed or avoided by putting this off. It's just you're kicking that can down the road versus by keeping stock today. Again, there's, there is sometimes case to do so. If you're fine elsewhere, in Sarah's case, for example, the majority of her net worth isn't in Apple stock. She already has, it sounds like, a diversified other portfolio that even if something were to happen to Apple, it wouldn't mean the entirety of her portfolio is going down with it. So when you're looking at that, it is, is important to understand this other considerations that I'd point out, specifically with people like Sarah who have stock compensation, even if you do sell your RSUs or your stock position today, you still have vested upside 
in Apple or in the company that you have the stock compensation with. And the reason for that is she has RSUs that haven't granted yet, or maybe there's additional stock compensation that's coming. So what that means is those are shares that assuming you stay with the company, you will still receive those shares. And so if the value of Apple stock or whatever the company is continues to go up, even after you've already sold all your existing shares, well, when those new RSUs vest, you get the benefit of whatever the performance has been of that company stock until then. So it's not as if you're totally divesting yourself of your company stock or company performance. It's just taking what you have and looking to diversify that. Number two, another thing I'd point out is I've had several clients who have had and who have built a significant amount of their wealth through holding their company's individual stock through their comp plans. And now we made sure their 401ks and their other investments and other assets were properly diversified so that they could afford to lose that money if something dropped with their company. But here's what I started to notice is even for people whose company stocks did dramatically better than the market over the time that they held them, they weren't automatically happier with that performance. And what happened is when a individual stock or an individual company makes up a good portion of your net worth, it's not something that you can just casually set aside. You almost become obsessed with checking the value of that stock. You can start to see in extreme cases, your net worth change six or seven figures, sometimes in a single day or week. And so when all your money is there, even if over time that stock ends up outperforming the market, meaning financially you're better off, I have witnessed plenty of times where emotionally these individuals were not better off because all of their energy, all of their attention, all their focus was constantly on how is the value of this stock performing to an unhealthy degree. So just keep that in mind. If even if your stock ends up outperforming over time, what's that going to cost you in terms of your sanity of being so focused on this one thing that makes up such a big portion of your overall net worth? Now I'm going to go back to Sarah's question real quick for the tax component. She says, and I quote, I've heard from other podcasts I should not have too much of my net worth in one stock and the only free lunch is diversification. I can sell all 250,000 of vested Apple shares tomorrow, but then I believe I'd get hit with a large tax bill for all of the gains, which seems like it could be a burden. I'm thinking I could start by selling the shares I've held for over a year to make sure to get the long-term gains tax rate instead of the short-term tax rate. And then next year I could do the same, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, as you're looking at this, I would start by understanding what's the biggest risk. So Sarah, if all of your net worth was in Apple and you had no other assets, I would lean towards selling more sooner rather than later. This is not a specific recommendation. And this again has nothing to do with Apple. This is just a general principle. The more of your net worth is tied up in a single stock, the quicker I would be to want to rebalance that and diversify that and not be as focused on the tax consequences simply because there's more at stake. Everything's in that single company versus a situation like Sarah's where she has about $700,000 already outside of Apple stock invested in the portfolio and Apple's about $250,000. Well, that is still a good amount of money, but it's not as if, if something happens to Apple, the entirety of her net worth is suffering. So because of that, if you look at your situation and say, you know what, I do want to diversify, but it's not as if everything's in this one company. It's not as if one downturn in this stock is going to prevent me from meeting my goals. Well, if that's the case, then taxes maybe and should become a bigger component in your decision-making process of take that 250 and understand, okay, of this 250,000, to go back to her example, which of these shares are long-term gains? Which of these shares are short-term gains? Now, with stock like this, it didn't vest all at once. It vested over a period of time. There may also have been some dividends reinvested in there. So when you look at that, there's different lots. So it doesn't just mean go sell stock and not pay attention to what shares or which lots you're selling. Look at the individual lots. Can you start by trying to sell the things that are going to minimize your tax liability? That's things that either don't have a gain, or if there is a gain, it's a long-term gain, so you're paying a more tax-preferred rate. When you do it that way, you're taking more chips off the table with less of a tax impact so that you can start to diversify, but do so in a tax efficient way. So to answer Sarah's question directly, yes, I do believe that is an approach that I would encourage considering of because that's not the majority of your net worth. I think it is good to diversify. It's not horrible to keep a part of Apple stock because you've already shown that you've got a good other portfolio, but for the amounts that you do want to start selling, look to do that in a tax efficient way. 
But in general, for someone that has a stock portfolio, that's a concentrated stock portfolio, what would I look at? Well, number one, I'd want to reframe what is risk truly. Risk is not just a tax burden that you're going to pay if you sell that. True risk is a downturn in that stock's value. And we know that on average, a majority of stocks underperform the market and a good portion of stocks dramatically underperform the market. So keep that in mind. Number two, if financially you don't need to sell stock, consider the non-financial implications, which is that emotional component of would you be okay, even if financially you're fine with the stock dropping significantly in value, would you emotionally be okay? That's kind of the second level or second layer of the thinking that I would look at and try to be objective about this. As I mentioned, it's easy to rationalize this and say, oh yeah, I'd be fine. But really what you're saying is, well, that's not going to happen to my stock or my company. So truly try to imagine what it would feel like if you do end up keeping the stock, if there would be a significant decline or even just significant underperformance relative to the rest of the market. And then three, make sure that you are doing any diversification or rebalancing in a tax efficient way if possible. In tax efficient, I would give that more or less weight depending upon how much of your portfolio was concentrated in that single stock, as I mentioned before. The more you have concentrated in a single stock, the greater the risk of a downturn. And so I would not look at taxes as much of a risk as I would of a market downturn versus the less that you have in that individual stock because your other portfolio or the rest of your portfolio makes up a larger percentage of your net worth. The more taxes and a tax efficient disposition of that stock is going to be something that I'd want to consider. So I hope that's helpful. Sarah, thank you very much for this question. If you are listening and enjoyed this, please let me know by leaving a review. And if you want to listen to this podcast and other great content and additional content on top of this, be sure to check out our YouTube page. It's under Root Financial. We do one video a week. We post one podcast per week. And occasionally we'll do additional videos or put out additional pieces of content there as well. As always, I appreciate you listening and taking this time to spend with me wherever you're listening. And I'll see you all next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Ready for Retirement podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please subscribe and let me know by leaving a five-star review. And as always, for a list of the notes and the resources mentioned in today's episode, you can find those at the Ready for Retirement website, which is readyforretirement.co. That's readyforretirement.co. And if you have a question that you would like for me to answer in a future episode, then you can also go to the Ready for Retirement website, readyforretirement.co. There's a page called Submit Your Question where you can submit a question for me to answer in a future episode. Thanks as always for listening, and I'll see you next time. Oh,